Hi, everyone, and a big Animal Training Academy embrace to you for tuning into the Training Tidbits podcast series. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I am super pumped about today's episode. You're going to have your socks blown off with the amazing information you're about to learn. I've been talking about this episode for a while now, and I know there's people out there that have been asking about it and waiting for it to come out. So here it is. Well, actually, to be more precise, it's a two-part series where we're going to be talking about enrichment. In this first part, we're going to be discussing what enrichment means what part animal training plays in enrichment, the importance of enrichment with your zoo animals, with your pets at home, and additionally in vet clinics. And then our guest is going to tell us about a recent trip they made to China for the purpose of presenting, learning, and networking in the area of animal enrichment. In part two, we're going to talk more about the process of coming up with new enrichment ideas and implementing programs for their use. We will talk about how to brainstorm new ideas, the importance of doing good research, the importance of goal setting with our enrichment, how we first offer novel enrichment items to our animals, and how we evaluate if those items have been successful. We will also touch on the importance of safety with novel enrichment and hear some stories from our guests' experience in working with a large array of different animal species and managing their enrichment programs. We will then wrap up by discussing the direction that enrichment is taking and our guests' vision for what they want to see transpire over the next five to ten years. So strap yourself in and be prepared to be entertained, educated, and inspired as we talk to Sarah Van Herpt from Wellington Zoo right here in New Zealand. Sarah is a lifelong learner, and this is clearly demonstrated by the qualifications she has under her belt. Sarah obtained a BSc in Ecology and Zoology from Massey University in New Zealand, as well as a Master's in Conservation Biology from the same university. During Sarah's studies, it really hit home to her that animal behavior was her passion. She wanted to develop a deep understanding of why animals do what they do. Her Master's degree examined how we can combine behavior behavior with conservation outcomes. Sarah studied the song of the native New Zealand Kokako bird and how it changed in the presence of multiple dialects or languages. After completion of her qualification, Sarah landed a job at Wellington Zoo where she has been for the past seven years, caring for a large variety of different species, including primates, birds, reptiles, invertebrates, small carnivores, and hoofstock. At heart, though, Sarah identifies herself as a bird nerd. Sarah's time at Wellington Zoo has also included a two-and-a-half-year stint as a vet nurse in the Wellington Zoo Wildlife Hospital. After training and obtaining a certificate in veterinary nursing while simultaneously working as a keeper. Throughout Sarah's career, she's developed a keen interest in enrichment and has run enrichment programs and participated as an enrichment committee member at Wellington Zoo. She's also worked alongside the Australian Society of Zookeeping to help organise some shape of enrichment workshops at Wellington Zoo in 2014 with a shape of enrichment co-founder Valerie Hare. Following on from this event, last year Sarah was awarded a special shape of enrichment grant to talk at the 15th International Conference on Environmental Enrichment in Beijing, China. Sarah also shares her home with a rainbow lorikeet named Manta and Sophia the cat. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome a very good friend of mine and enrichment specialist, one Sarah Van Herp to the show. Sarah, how are you? Oh, I'm good, thanks, Ryan. Excited to be here. I'm pumped as well, Sarah. We're going to dive straight in today and we're going to start off by discussing what enrichment is. What is the definition of enrichment, Sarah? What do we mean when we say environmental enrichment? Is enrichment as simple as giving our animals something novel that we think it will like and then walking away and never thinking about it again and maybe dive a little bit into what are the benefits of giving our animals enrichment? Well, Ryan, I really like the shape of enrichment definition of enrichment, which is that it's a dynamic process for enhancing animal environment environments within the context of the animal's behavioural biology and natural history. So we make changes to their environment with the goal of increasing the animal's behavioural choices and drawing out their species appropriate behaviours, which then in turn enhances animal welfare. So there's five different categories of enrichment that we can look at. We've got social enrichment, which is things like conspecifics, different species, people, so visitors, keepers, doing training and things like that. We've got cognitive enrichment, so puzzles for the animals to solve mental stimulation novel experiences and again training is a good one for that we've got their physical habitat so perching substrates dens nests etc we've got sensory enrichment so anything that targets that sense 
sense of hearing, eyesight, smell, touch, taste. And then you've got your food enrichment as well. So it's a really big range of different things and it's anything that the animal can perceive in any way, shape or form. And ideally it has a behavioral goal behind it. So it's really important to not just, as Ryan said, pop something in that's new and different and then walk away. We want to think about why we're putting that new different thing in, what it is that we want to see from the item and if our goal I guess has been met as well. So enrichment has got lots of different benefits and it's not just for zoo animals, it's for pets and animals and vet clinics as well. It's really important for their welfare, for their behavioural health, so we can increase their behavioural repertoire by giving them enrichment to try and draw out those different things that they might do. It helps them to show species appropriate behaviours. It helps with their ability to adapt too. If you raise an animal in an environment where nothing changes and there's never anything different or new, then that animal's ability to cope and adapt in different situations is completely lessened. So by using enrichment, we can help counteract that. It's really important for cultural transmission of behaviours as well. We've got lots of species out there that learn off each other and using enrichment, you can provide an atmosphere of learning for those species. It's got some really science and technical benefits as well. So using enrichment can increase brain and hippocampus size in terms of their welfare, especially while they're in hospital. Using enrichment can help to decrease stress and we know that stress affects wound healing and potential time in hospital so that's really important as well. It can reduce or prevent stereotypies which are something not just seen in zoo animals but definitely in vet clinics and with your pets at home. You could be seeing stereotypies such as pacing, self-harm like plucking or over grooming um, and enrichment helps to reduce or even stop or prevent those from occurring. With enrichment in our zoos it actually can help with the visitor experience and education as well. We can use enrichment in our talks and encounters and experiences to showcase natural behaviours and explain them to people. It also helps people to understand how we actually look after the welfare of our animals. So we can explain that we're not just throwing toys in, it's got a specific purpose. We're looking for a goal, behaviour and what we want to see and it helps make those connections that make people care about the animals. It is a really good management tool in zoos, so using enrichment we can help with shifting with introductions on their habitat so different furniture and stuff if you've got a bear destroying a particular pole why not give it a bunch of rotten logs instead to destroy and so it's kind of sum that up we're trying to give them things that they can perceive but are goal-based and have a purpose yeah and I really like those different kind of categories of enrichment you gave. And what I found really interesting about the Shape of Enrichment Workshop was really putting our brains to work and thinking that all those categories aren't necessarily specific or as important for every single animal. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so that's where knowing your natural history for your species comes in. So say for example we're looking at the Tasmanian devil. We might not necessarily go for something that's visual as our first port of call because they aren't necessarily super visual animals but they do have an amazing sense of smell and a great sense of hearing. So we might want to target those senses first. It's not to say rule out the other things but by knowing the animal you have more chance of your enrichment being successful. So social enrichment might not be so important for something like a tiger which is solitary in the wild but you might want to target that sort of natural hunting behavior instead. Awesome thanks for that Sarah and I'm sure everyone out there now is starting to develop a much clearer picture in their minds of what we mean when we say enrichment and I'm so excited because in this episode and also as mentioned in part two we're really going to be providing some amazing information about all the important and different aspects of enrichment. I want to expand even further on this definition now if you don't mind and talk about where animal training fits into all of us. I was at a pretty major event earlier this year. They had a lot of people present from the local zoological community and someone stood up at this event and did a presentation about enrichment and made a statement during their talk that animal training is not enrichment. And I don't think I agree with that. I was curious to discuss this idea with you and ask you what part animal training plays. Well, I totally agree with you. I think that animal training is a really important part of enrichment. Like I said before, it encompasses two of those five categories. It's social, it's you interacting with the animals, spending time with them, doesn't necessarily have to be in the habitat with them, but even through mesh contact, 
it's something different. You're not there the whole day. You're not cleaning their habitat. You're actually interacting with them, giving them specific attention. As I was saying before, training is also really important with that cognitive aspect of enrichment. With training, we're teaching animals to participate in their own care. And I think that's really important for their brain. It keeps them really mentally stimulated. You can do different kinds of training that will help, I guess, that animal showcase natural behaviours as well. If you've got animals that aren't cohesing as a group, you can do socialisation training training and that's getting the whole group thinking together whilst you're doing your training yeah so training is about learning new behaviors right and what about an enrichment item that requires some technical skill from our animal sometimes we have to give that item to our animal and use training to facilitate its use yeah exactly especially things like puzzle feeders you might give a puzzle feeder to an animal multiple times without any success so you need to think about maybe making that a bit easier and that's part of training as well you can target them to the enrichment item target them to different parts of the enrichment item say it's a puzzle feeder that has a lever and you want your bird to stand on the lever or you know whatever it is you can start that enrichment process off using training training and then sort of teaching them to interact with that object which then can lead to the, your enrichment outcome. Yeah definitely learning's involved there and we should leverage the knowledge that we have to be able to manage our animals behavior in that way so it makes sense to incorporate animal training in all the areas of enrichment really or some sort of plan to make sure our animals are learning new things with that enrichment item. I think that some enrichment has to be targeting those instinctual behaviours, those things like hunting behaviours. In New Zealand, it's illegal to feed out live prey. So if we are just providing food, it's not necessarily going to target their hunting behaviour. So you might use your enrichment to get those instincts sort of flowing again rather than necessarily having to teach them. So I think training definitely has to happen as part of enrichment, but also that sometimes your enrichment isn't about teaching, it's just that animal interacting and and drawing out those natural behaviours in tandem with your training. Great. Hey, thanks so much for all that, Sarah. It's so fun to talk about this stuff. There's a lot of people listening to this podcast that don't work in zoological settings. We have a huge variety of different animals people are applying this information to which is really exciting one of the biggest groups of people would just be those that have animals that share their homes with us whether it be dogs cats birds reptiles ferrets pigs you name it sarah moving forward can you Tell us, please, the importance of good enrichment programs with our animals at home. Well, speaking from experience with my cat and bird, I have an indoor cat. As one of the issues that we have in New Zealand with our wildlife is that they're not used to being in an environment with predators. So having cats around is actually really detrimental. But I love my cat, so I want to keep her. So what we do is keep her inside. But being an indoor cat, she needs exercise and she needs me to help facilitate that hunting need that she might have so for me it's about keeping her healthy making sure she doesn't get too fat (laughs) and making sure she stays nice and fit as well so I use enrichment a lot in that with our things like birds I don't let my bird outside to fly around because I'm not sure that he would not fly away so get him to fly around the house and put different things around for him to go and investigate and explore and show those sort of natural behaviors also with our pets we're not home 24 7 and so we really need to make sure that we're looking out for their welfare while we're not home so giving them different things to do while we're gone helps fill that gap that we might find when we're not at home yeah really great information sarah and there's people sitting out there listening to this podcast probably wondering about doing enrichment programs with their animals because they might not have really thought about this before and one other thing i I thought we'd talk about before we move on to the next question and i thought i'd bring this up because it's something that i discuss with a lot of animal training academies members is that they've got a number of animals living in the same household so they might have two cats and two dogs or they might have a bird and a cat whatever the combination of different animals is and how we could potentially use enrichment to and you mentioned this earlier in the podcast with a bear example how we could potentially use enrichment to redirect some of the behaviors that we're labeling as undesirable with our pets yeah that's a really good question and i definitely have an example from my two creatures at home so i let my bird and cat have access to the house together but i don't keep the cat 
locked away while the bird is out or vice versa. So what I do is I use enrichment to redirect any behaviours that I see with the cat that I don't want her to be doing with the bird. The bird will walk across the floor and investigate lots of different things. And if you've got a cat, you sometimes you notice they're going to get really playful. And so what I do is I redirect that playfulness onto one of her different toys. She loves to chase a laser pointer. She really gets into catnip. She likes to play fetch, which is really interesting. But when she is looking in that playful mood, then I'll get some enrichment out for her and interact with her while keeping the bird occupied with other enrichment elsewhere. So some things that he really likes, and I'm not really sure why, he really likes spoons. He'll lift them up and carry them around the floor. So I try and keep them occupied separately if I notice that any pouncing behavior might start happening. Yeah, cool. So interesting to identify precursors to undesirable behaviors and and try to offer your animal alternative options rather than proceed with the things that we've labeled as undesirable. Curious as well, Sarah, to get your thoughts on motivation behind doing undesirable behaviors. So to build upon that, obviously we're going to be vigilant about what we think our animals might be doing. What do you think about offering for example, with your cat getting into a playful mood laser earlier in the day and how that potentially satiates that animal's desire for those types of behaviours and whether that influences that animal's behavioural repertoire over the entire day. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a really good point. With my two, Sophia is quite lazy, so she isn't one to play all the time. But if you can keep your animal enriched throughout the day and at different times, then that's a really good tool to use to redirect any undesirable behaviours. So you've got cats and dogs, offer your dog something in one part of the house, the cat something in a different part of the house so that when they come together, they are already all played out and wanting to have a sleep or just a bit more chilled out or and vice versa. Knowing what reaction your animal has to enrichment is really important. If you're going to give an animal something that they really enjoy or really get worked up about or protective of and you're having sort of other issues with other animals in your house, then you're going to want to keep those two things very very separate so don't give favorite toys and favorite enrichments necessarily around each other if it's going to lead to over excitement which can cause problems and vice versa if you've just had some really great interactions with your animals that you're worried about then reward them with that favorite enrichment so you've just been really nice to this cat so now we're going to go over here and we're going to do this enrichment thing as a reward which is training use your enrichment in your training as one of your reinforcers as well yeah and definitely is very similar to training in a lot of aspects I think in so much as there is no black or white there isn't this will work or this won't work there is we know our cat likes to chase let's offer it chasing behaviour some other time during the day and then let's let our cat tell us if that is appropriate for that animal in that situation rather than this will or won't work yeah absolutely cool lots to think about for the people listening to this podcast and have pets at home I was wondering now if we could discuss the importance of enrichment in another area where a lot of animal training academies members might might be working and that is in a zoological setting we kind of touched on this briefly at the start of the podcast Sarah can we dive a little bit deeper into this topic the importance of enrichment in zoological settings yeah sure thing I think that most of the benefits that I talked about earlier are so relevant to zoos one of the really important things in a zoo setting is actually engaging your visitors in what you're doing if you understand what you're doing and can explain it in a passionate way that's going to help get across your messages that you're trying to talk about so you can explain while zoos are changing and we're always improving our habitats we know that we are in a zoo setting because something's gone wrong in the wild and we can't just keep the animals out there we need to have them in the zoo to help out so that's where our enrichment comes in it's helping us to create positive welfare states for the animals it's helping us to show those different behavioral repertoires things like our servals we can't give them a pond with live fish we can't give them birds that fly around for them to jump up and catch it's not legal in New Zealand so what we do is we do that in different ways in enrichment. Our servals have a feather on the end of a pole that they love to pounce on and jump up to get. We have pools that we can float food and different objects in that they'll use their paws to hook out. And we can explain to people what's going on with those cats and then relate that to an important issue in New Zealand, which is how our pet cats are doing these sorts of behaviours, but with our beautiful wild birds and how our visitors can help our wild birds. So it all interlinks together and it's just really important to 
actually communicate what you're doing so people don't just think you've put junk and rubbish in your animals' habitats. Yeah, really important stuff. And I hope all you out there listening are getting inspired and full of ideas listening to this stuff. We're really going to dive deeper in the next episode about how to come up with all these ideas and some good practice with regards to placing it in our animals' environments and testing out the ideas we do come up with. For now, though, we're going to shortly talk about your recent environmental enrichment odyssey to China, which I'm really looking forward to hearing more about, as I'm sure everyone here listening is as well. But before we do, I want to discuss one more area where you've had a great opportunity to work with enrichment. And this is animals in a vet clinic or a wildlife hospital. Can you maybe expand your thoughts on the importance of offering enrichment in these spaces? Yeah, absolutely. I can think of a few examples as well where it's actually been really useful for us. So at Wellington Zoo, our vet hospital, the Nest Kohanga, is actually not just a zoo vet hospital. We also take in injured native wildlife and our goal is to rehabilitate them and release them back out into the wild. And in New Zealand, and we've got some beautiful parrot species, all of which are extremely intelligent. And that means that a wild parrot coming into hospital, it can get bored, it can get stressed, it can get nervous. And so one of the things that we do is use enrichment to try and help that. A while ago, we had a kaka come in who we nicknamed Stompy because every time we treated him and put him back into his enclosure, he would start stomping his feet. Not ideal for him as he had a broken leg. So we wanted to try and get him to stay still without making him really bored. So we had to come up with a lot of different ideas. In the end, we actually used paper, threaded through the habitat and he would destroy that. And that was the thing that particular bird really enjoyed. So we play around with this a lot so that we can keep them mentally stimulated and stress-free while providing for their veterinary care as well. We also use it to prevent things like bandage interference. We don't want them chewing catheters or anything like that. And if they're wounded and have a bandage on, we want them to be able to leave that on and as we're a rehabilitation and release facility we like to use it to get the animals back to doing their natural behaviors before release so again with kaka we have very large free flight aviaries for them that we use as part of the rehabilitation process and we we'll use quite natural based enrichment throughout the habitat to get them to build up their flight muscles and get really fit before release and also use lots of flowers and leaves and berries that are in season that are food sources they're going to find when they're back out in the wild so we're helping getting them ready to go back out as well cool and definitely really important for getting those wild behaviors back and one of the cool things i remember about the nest tikohanga the wildlife hospital at wellington zoo was a saltwater pool that you guys have there for the seabirds that come in and then that's a deep pool and they can swim around in it and it's such a great ability to be able to prepare those birds and their readiness for going back to the wild that a lot of wildlife hospitals don't have would you classify that as enrichment sarah yeah absolutely that saltwater pool it is massive we have things that we can put in and we can change in that habitat that makes it different that sets that animal up with that expectation that everything's not the same all the time that they need to have that I guess idea in their head before they are released again and they've got different things happening as well that saltwater pool is actually visible to our visitors so that they can come and watch what happens in the rehabilitation so having different people and different things happen outside that window is another aspect it's not enrichment in your typical term that you're putting something in but that's social enrichment that's different species coming up to where that animal's being rehabilitated and they're seeing it they can choose to go close to it they can choose to go away from it and yeah it's really important for getting them used to being back out in the wild where they've got lots of different things going on and you've had some pretty amazing animals through that wildlife hospital yeah albatross the field and crested penguin that's pretty exciting and i'm sure you had some other kind of penguin there at some point oh yes <laughs> happy feet he enjoyed that ice and he definitely enjoyed that saltwater pool Happy feet for those listening out there was an uh, emperor penguin who where did he land up on a beach here in Pika Pika Beach. Pika Pika Beach. And so interesting. And thank you so much for sharing all that great information, Sarah. Sadly, we're nearly at the end of the first part of this two-part series. But as mentioned before we wrap up, I'd really like for you to take us on a journey. You were recently really fortunate to receive a Shape of Enrichment grant and travel to Beijing, China to attend the 15th International Environmental Enrichment Conference. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. I am fascinated to learn more about your experience and what you got up to and what you learned whilst on this trip. Yeah, so I went over in May 2015. I was lucky enough to speak at the conference. So it was really, really interesting. There's lots of people from across the world. I think there's about 11 or 12 different countries represented. It's the first time the conference had ever been held in Asia. 
So that was really different and really exciting. And there's definitely some common themes from the talk. So enrichment is quite a new concept to Asia. So it's really exciting that they got involved and held this conference in China. So what they're focusing on is a lot of learning around enrichment. So we had a lot of really awesome talks on what they were doing. So what behaviors they saw from their animals before giving enrichment. And then they came up with an idea, gave the enrichment and then studied what happened to the animal afterwards. So that was really interesting to hear that. We also had a group of middle school students come and do a talk and they'd done an enrichment project at Beijing Zoo where they did that same process. They were given a species, they re researched the species, came up with a behavioural goal and some enrichment that was aiming to meet that goal and they put it in. They had issues and so they went back to the drawing board and came up with ways that they could fix the issues and carried those out and had enrichment success and it was really inspiring to see them. It was really cool. We also had a lot of talks with some pretty common themes coming through. My favourite one was Valerie here from Shape of Enrichment. She actually talked on the importance of enrichment for physical fitness. So we know our animals are healthy, we look after them in that way, but are they agile? Can they do those things that they would do in the world? Can that tiger climb up that pole? Can this other species balance like they should be able to it's not just about being healthy but are the animals actually physically fit and how can we do that because you're not going to give a tiger that's never climbed a pole a feed at the top of the pole and expect them to do well that's how you lead to injuries she talked a lot about how you build the animals up in that way which i found really really inspiring there's a lot of talk around enrichment in habitat design so when you're thinking about your new habitats for your animals actually incorporating it into your design from the start not as an add on at the end or something that you're going to put in afterwards um, and that just really sets your animals up to sort of succeed and, and get the most that they can from that habitat. One of the other talks that I was really fascinated in and really jogged my brain into thinking yeah that's right maybe we should definitely be doing more of that was one from a lady from an American zoo and she gave mainly just a video and photo presentation of enrichment with farmyard animals. So we use our farmyard animals a lot in zoos as what we call in New Zealand contact animals so animals that your visitors can touch and get really close to but sometimes we think that that's the only enrichment that they need just that social thing but you've got to remember we've got five categories and we need to try and meet all of those categories so she showed some beautiful photos and videos from her zoo of a lot of different things that they do for their sheep their goats their horses their cattle and I think that was really important to me and one thing that I really took away from it is it's not just about your parrots and your primates and your large carnivores it's got to be about a holistic view of your whole zoo and what enrichment you're doing for everyone not just those big sort of easy to do things really cool thanks for all of that sarah that does unfortunately bring us to the end of part one but before we wrap up this half i just wanted to say from myself and on behalf of everyone listening in the audience a massive massive thank you to you sarah thank you oh thanks ryan that was fun i hope that you out there listening to that enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed making it for you it has been so much fun learning more about enrichment and i'm sure there were so many little gems of information that you as the audience took away from today and will inspire you moving forward as already mentioned though we are not finished yet on this topic of enrichment. This is only part one and in part two we're going to dive in much deeper giving you loads of vital information about best practice when it comes to creating and offering new enrichment for your animals. So stay tuned because if you like this episode you're definitely not going to want to miss that one. I heard a stat the other day that most podcast shows don't last past the eighth episode and we are fast approaching episode 20 so this is super cool. I want to thank you so much everyone out there that listens. I know every single day there's just more and more downloads of the podcast from the website and loads of people are subscribing on itunes etc as well so just buckets of gratitude to all you out there who tune in if you're quite new to the show and you haven't listened to many of the episodes then make sure to head over to animaltrainingacademy.com we are your one-stop solution to all your behavioral challenges the free content by itself is changing people's lives there's obviously these free podcasts there's the free 15 lesson online training tidbits course material, video content, written content, audio, PDFs, quizzes, and more. So much to sink your teeth into there. There's also the free live events slash web classes. If you want to know more about those, then hit the webinar button in the main menu to find out when the next ones are on. And then there's the VIP mentor programs, which are the pinnacle of amazingness and so much fun, where you and I connect one-on-one. -on -one. If you hit the VIP mentor program button in the main menu on animaltrainingacademy.com, I've also added a link there where you can actually request a 
free 20 minute video call consultation about your individual training project. I've done quite a few of these already. And once again, I just absolutely love connecting with you guys personally. So if you're interested in that, hit the VIP mentor program button and then click on the blue link there to request your free video call. That's pretty much it from us for this episode though. If you have any thoughts and feelings about everything you've just heard, then please leave a comment on the podcast right up or on iTunes. Tell us if you liked the episode or tell us if you didn't like the episode or whatever you want to learn about in future episodes. Absolutely anything at all. I'd just love to hear from you. Until next time, farewell for now. Good luck with all your training endeavors and you'll be hearing from me again soon. Toodaloo.